So welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, now we have a talk by Alan Caldwell uh, from MPI Munich, and he's going to talk about plasma weak field acceleration and awake. Yes, so thanks for the invitation. I'm sorry I couldn't attend in person. Uh, it's a very busy time here. Uh, but I'm going to tell you uh, about plasma wake field acceleration with the focus on our awake program. Uh, so the motivation for looking into uh, a new kind of accelerator is basically to see if we could uh, find a way to, to find more compact, uh, less expensive uh, colliders that can bring us to higher energy. So I think everybody in your workshop, of course, knows the uh, projects which are being discussed for the future. So there's, for example, the existing uh, LHC is this small ring. And if we look at then proton uh, colliders that have been discussed for the future, uh, there's, of course, the FCC. Uh, there's also, of course, the Chinese version. Um, and so these are very much larger. So the energy limit for circular proton colliders is basically given by the strength of the magnetic field. So if we want to go to higher energies um, and we have a limit on the strength of the magnetic fields that we can provide, then we have to make ever larger colliders. So the energy gain here relies primarily on magnet development. And of course, then there's a large effort, very significant effort uh, underway to try to improve the strength of the magnets. Uh, if we want to go to a collider, which uh, basically collides point-like particles, as far as we know, electrons, muons, so the leptons, um, of course, this is preferred in many ways because then we're colliding uh, simpler objects than the protons. Uh, but there, because of the radiation problem, so the power radiated is uh, proportional to the gamma factor to the fourth power. If we try to go into a circular accelerator, we have to build a linear uh, accelerator uh, to get to the very highest energies. And so this means very, very long and, uh, accelerator complexes. So this makes things also, of course, then difficult and expensive. So this is why we think about uh, using a plasma and the plasma is a collection of three positive and negative charges. And the reason we want to think about using a plasma is we can sustain very high electric fields in a plasma. So the idea is if we have a plasma, then we can imagine sending an intense particle beam or an intense laser beam through the plasma. So here's uh, in this picture, uh, you can see here, there's something called the drive pulse. This could be a compact a uh, beam bunch of electrons, for example, or a compact or a laser, short laser pulse. And the effect is to drive the plasma electrons outwards if the radial, if you have an electric field pointing radially out. And, uh, and these electrons then start to move in the plasma. So maybe I should say, first of all, um, in the zeroth approximation, the ions we think are very much heavier than the electrons. And during the time of this interaction, we think of the, of the ions as basically stationary. So the only thing moving in the plasma are the electrons. So we have our drive pulse and uh, it starts the electrons moving. Here, of course, there's a 2D, 2D picture, but the, the fields here are radial. So the electrons are pushed out radially. This drive pulse is, is very short. So it, uh, and it's moving with the speed of light in this direction. So after it's uh, passed, then what's left behind is a positive uh, column of the ions, which we say are immobile. So the electrons see this positive uh, column left behind and then they come back on axis. So if we think back here, uh, these are the electrons which are coming back on axis after our drive pulse has moved. So basically, the electrons are undergoing some kind of simple harmonic motion uh, across the axis. And depending on the phase, uh, you get this kind of bubble structure in, uh, in the plasma. 
And now the idea is to put uh, your particles that you want to accelerate, so let's say another bunch of electrons in this location. And in this location, you have a very strong electric field because of the overdensity of the plasma electrons, which are located here. So this is the basic idea. And, uh, and in fact, uh, the physics, at least in this zeroth approximation is quite simple. So the frequency at which our plasma electrons are oscillating is given by this expression. And it depends basically on just fundamental parameters, the charge and the mass of the electron. And on the square root, when we take the square root of this uh, uh, square of the angular frequency here, so on the square root of the plasma density. So to get some numbers in here, we can think, so if we have, uh, imagine our, our whole structure is moving with the speed of light, we can calculate a wavelength uh, given this frequency. And this wavelength for plasma density of 10 to the 15 uh, uh, free electrons per cubic centimeter is one millimeter. Okay, so we make little one millimeter structures. They could be smaller if we have a higher plasma density. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is basically, how this is scaling. Okay, so the idea here uh, is not so new. In fact, it dates back to Tajima and Dawson. And, uh, and so it's from 1979. And they were imagining uh, what at the time seemed like uh, really science fiction lasers that produce 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter squared and would then uh, be able to produce electric fields at the level of 100 gigavolts per meter. So this is more than three orders of magnitude higher than what we have today in our uh, particle accelerators. So this is what made uh, this idea look very exciting. So the original idea was for lasers, a uh, driver here, but then particle beams as drivers were also introduced very soon thereafter by Pizin Chen. And uh, basically if we have a compact charged particle beam, then again, the, the fields are just transverse in our frame when the, when the particles are moving by the speed of light. Uh, so basically the physics is the same. So this is uh, how in principle, the plasma acceleration works. And why, okay. <clears throat> so now the question is, what is the right way to do it? What kind of driver uh, do we want to actually use to build our plasma accelerator? And so here we have different choices. Uh, so the point is, if we're thinking about a high energy collider, uh, normally we'd like to really collide bunches of particles. And so here we have to look at the energy content of a bunch of particles. So imagine we have uh, 10 to the 10 particles at one TeV, then in one bunch of uh, these 10 to 10 particles, uh, the energy content is a few kilojoules. So we're gonna have to conserve energy. So whatever energy uh, is in the driver, that's the maximum energy that we can transfer to this bunch of particles that we're accelerating. So these lasers, which now today reach these very high uh, power levels, 10 to the 18 and more watts per centimeter squared, they achieve it primarily by producing a very short pulse. And if we look and see how much energy is actually in that laser pulse, then it's at the level of tens of joules typically for the state-of-the-art lasers. So it's actually quite far from the few kilojoules that we would need. Uh, if we look at existing electron beams, for example, the facet beam at SLAC, uh, that has 30 joules in one bunch of electrons. Again, very far from a few kilojoules. So if we wanna realize a plasma accelerator based on either lasers or electron bunches, you would have to have a staged system. So that's what these, um, these drawings here describe. So here from uh, Rim Lehmann and Eric Essere from in Physics Today, they described what a, a staged uh, laser plasma accelerator might look like. So you would have the, the two wings, let's say for an E plus E minus collider, each stage would provide about uh, 10 GeV of acceleration and you would have a hundred of these stages to get to the TeV level. So although the uh, acceleration is very, very strong inside these plasma uh, regions, let's say hundred gigavolts per meter, 
uh, you lose effectively uh, a lot of the, the strength or the average strength because of the gaps in between these cells. And you have to sort out how you're going to extract uh, electrons out of one plasma cell and re-inject them into the next. It's the same thing for the uh, electron-driven plasma accelerator. So here's a, a, a kind of layout put together by Eric Adley. Um, and again, it's many, many stages uh, of acceleration so that you can reach the, the TV scale. So um, this complexity of having to have many stages, basically due to the limited energy in these drivers, uh, led us to think about using protons to drive the, uh, the plasma weight. And the reason is, if we take a bunch of protons from the SPS at CERN, uh, that's already 20 kilojoules, LHC bunches of protons, 300 kilojoules. So in principle, we could accelerate at least based on the energy budget, our uh, electrons, one bunch, 10 to the 10 particles, say, to the TeV with one bunch of protons. And so we wouldn't need all of this staging. So we did some, uh, some calculations. <clears throat> and indeed, we showed that at least, it, of course, in simulation, uh, with one LHC-driven stage, we could produce five or six TV electron bunches. And, uh, and so this, in principle, can work. Okay, so one of the uh, questions might be dephasing. Um, so, of course, protons are much heavier than electrons. And so you might think, ah, oh, the electron will outrun uh, my proton at some point. Well, it's true, it does happen, but this... Uh, goes like one over the gamma factor squared. And so with the SPS, this dephasing problem, basically electrons catching up with uh, protons, uh, only happens after about 100 meters. At the LHC, it takes many kilometers. Basically, you see it here. And with the FCC, if it were to exist, would be really um, much, much longer. We don't have to worry about it at all. Okay, so... Um, so what are the problems, what are the issues if we want to use uh, protons to drive our plasma wake? So I mentioned that the driver has to be very short. And uh, the reason is that we want to produce these very basically radially uh, outward um, electric fields. So we need our electric fields to go radially outwards. Oops. And they should also be compact. So if we have a long bunch, then, so here's from uh, Feynman's board uh, explaining, of course, the, the, how the electric fields look transverse to us uh, when we have a fast moving uh, charge coming by. Imagine you have a long bunch, then these radial electric fields would be produced over a long distance in this direction. And this would then destroy the, this plasma wave that you're trying to produce. So we need, to have it compact. In fact, here's a kind of an engineering formula, which you can see that the, the maximum electric field that we'll be able to produce in the longitudinal direction by uh, compressing our, or having our plasma electrons come back on axis goes like one over the length of our bunch, this driver here, this is in this case where, where the sigma Z is the, is the pulse that's driving this plasma wave. It goes like one over this distance to the square. And today's proton beams or bunches have, uh, have very sizable distances, like tens of centimeters or 10 centimeters. I think at the LHC, something like eight centimeters. And so basically, this is a huge reduction factor, and we don't get very strong electric fields. So we need to find a way somehow to have very compact, uh, compressed longitudinally um, proton bunches. <clears throat> so this is the main limitation. I mentioned the uh, dephasing aspect. So the electrons at some point, if we're accelerating electrons with our proton driver, uh, the electrons will start to outrun the protons. That means they'll move away from this strongly accelerating phase into a phase where actually they get defocused and, and we would lose the electrons. So, but as I also said, this dephasing goes like one of a gamma factor squared. So at very high energies where gamma is large, this uh, doesn't cause a, a significant problem. Um, normally in our accelerators, 
course, we tried to accelerate in vacuum um, and because we don't want the particle interaction. So you might wonder if I'm trying to do acceleration in plasma, um, isn't this going to scatter away all my particles? And uh, of course, this is an issue, uh, but we can calculate the interaction length. And I mentioned a plasma density, and this is at the level that we would be interested in, for example, for our proton driven plasma acceleration. With these densities, it's actually a pretty decent vacuum. Uh, so it's not a, a high density of particles, and the interaction length is actually quite long. It's uh, more than a thousand kilometers. So this allows us to really accelerate over significant distances before we lose too many particles through particle interactions. So really the fundamental issue here is the length of the proton bunch. And the question is, can we squeeze the protons together uh, in the longitudinal direction so that we can have significant wake fields? So here nature uh, really saved us. And in fact, the, 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 the plasma interaction is what saves us here. So what happens is that if we send a long bunch of protons into a plasma, then there is a natural interaction between this long bunch and the protons, which uh, modulates the proton bunch. This was first discussed in this uh, seminal paper uh, by, by these authors uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And this is the so-called transverse two-stream instability. And uh, here I have a little movie, uh, what happens. So you imagine here in, in the yellow orange color, these are individual protons in a bunch. So this is um, here half of a long proton bunch and it's traveling through the plasma, oops. And as it does so, then you notice that uh, some of the protons get pinched towards the axis and some of the protons get kicked outwards regularly. And the pattern develops, we call uh, these little uh, segments of the proton bunch here, micro bunches. And these micro bunches are spaced at exactly this plasma wavelength, which I mentioned. So what this allows is then, uh, in fact, these micro bunches will act coherently to increase the, uh, the plasma wave that we're creating. So instead of having one driver, which is driving our plasma wake field, we have a large number of smaller drivers, each acting coherently to drive this plasma wake. And we found in our calculations that indeed with this kind of approach, we can generate fields which are effectively as strong as if we had started with one single uh, bunch driving the wake field. So this is what in fact allows us to, to use uh, the proton bunches also as drivers of our plasma wake field, although these proton bunches, you might think, are much too long to drive significant plasma wake. So <clears throat> this is our approach, and here uh, summarized. So one of the keys is that um, we need to be able to control the timing of this modulation process because we're going to want to inject some electrons into this uh, plasma wake field that we've created. And we have to inject the electrons at just the right place so that they're feeling the strong accelerating fields and are not in some different location where they might get kicked out. So in order to create this, uh, this timing, we have to seed what we call seed this modulation process. And we do this with a short laser pulse. So we have here in this uh, picture, the protons are in red. And, uh, and, we, and they're traveling through the plasma. There's a short laser pulse, which starts this modulation process. And then this builds up this strong plasma wake. And now we can accelerate our electrons with a timing, which is defined relative to the short laser pulse. So this is the scheme that we uh, developed. Uh, so this all looked quite promising. So uh, we decided to build up collaboration and try this out. So here's uh, our very first meeting. Uh, Frank, which I think is in your meeting, is also in this picture and uh, part of our initial uh, discussions. Um, so uh, we, we discussed all of this, uh, these ideas. They looked nice. 
2013, we submitted a design report. Uh, it was approved and in three years, basically was the time it took us to build up the experiment and our program and started in 2016. So we have now this awake collaboration to carry out this, uh, this plasma wake field acceleration based on a proton driver. And uh, we're up to 22 institutes. Of course, it's maybe a little misleading because many of the institutes here are just a couple of people. So the actual active number of people in the collaboration is more like 50, uh, but it's still, I think, uh, a strong collaboration and we're making good progress. So that's our collaboration. The experiment, since we're using protons, uh, takes place at CERN and we need the, the CERN beams. So um, here is the CERN accelerator complex. Um, you see the different stages in blue here. This ring is the SPS. And there's this beam line, which was already existing before we started. It was the CERN Neutrino Stagan Sasso CNGS. Uh, facility. And uh, this program sending the neutrinos to CERN, uh, to, to Gran Sasso ended in 2012. So this site became available to, for us. So uh, we installed our experiment in, in this beam line. So basically here, so just ahead of the, uh, of the dump, so-called beam or the target where the protons were used to generate pions and the neutrinos. So this is uh, our location. Uh, this is what the, the layout looks like. So down here, this is a 750 meter long proton beam lines I said already existed uh, before. So we didn't uh, have to come up with the money to build this ourselves. It was already there. So this is the, the proton beam line leading to this target, which was used to produce the neutrinos for CNGS. And this drawing, the protons are coming this way. Uh, here in orange is our plasma cell. Here is a wall behind which was the target, which is highly radioactive uh, to, to make the neutrinos for Gran Sasso. Um, we have here a couple of things. So there's uh, the, an electron source, which we'll discuss, and there's also a laser. So here's the laser room. And as I mentioned, we need the laser uh, to create both create the plasma and seed. Uh, this modulation. Okay, so the heart of our experiment is the plasma and the plasma source is something that we designed and uh, had built uh, from our Max Planck and Sue for Physics. Uh, it's based on a rubidium vapor. So we heat up some rubidium, create a rubidium vapor, and then ionize this rubidium vapor uh, with a laser and in this way create our plasma. Uh, rubidium is very good because of the, the very low ionization energy of that electron. And so what we can do is we can measure the rubidium vapor density uh, very accurately and then ionize, singly ionize every rubidium atom along the path of the laser. And then we have a very well-defined plasma density. So this is a key for us to have a, a very well-controlled plasma density. In fact, we think uh, we, or not think, we know that, uh, that we measure the plasma density at the 0.2% level, which is actually quite uh, impressive for uh, plasma physics. <clears throat> so we had our first run uh, in 2016. Uh, so maybe amazingly enough uh, in this day and age, our experiment was uh, set up was on time, on budget, and uh, we had everything built and got started. Um, we had in 2016, basically four days of running, that's it. And, uh, but, and the first three days, nothing worked. But on the fourth day at uh, five in the morning, uh, finally we got some nice data. And so everybody was very happy. So this was, a, I think, a very successful start to our experiment. <clears throat> so what did we see in what we call run one? So run one was uh, 2016 to 2018. And our goal in run one, uh, there were a couple of goals. One was to look at this modulation process of the protons. So what you see here, this is now real data. Uh, we have a, a device called the screen camera, which allows us to really measure 
uh, in time the uh, passage of the particles so we can measure the longitudinal profile of our proton bunch. And so here in the top image is without plasma, what our proton bunch looks like. And it's a very nice, uh, basically Gaussian distribution of protons along the bunch. And then, so in, in this picture, uh, the, the protons are moving towards the left. And then we turn on the plasma and we have the seed basically in this location, uh, which starts the modulation process and you see the formation of these micro bunches. And we can do this for many uh, events at a time and stack them up. And you see that basically these micro bunches always line up at the same place. And this is what tells us that we, in fact, control the timing of this process. And so we can uh, know when to inject our electrons that we want to accelerate. So this was a very successful start to our experimental program, demonstrating that we can create these micro bunches out of the long proton bunch. We then uh, studied whether the, the behavior of this micro bunching was what we expected. This slide, I think, is too technical. Uh, but basically, there was a predicted uh, modulation frequency, which I showed you at the very beginning, should go like the square root of the plasma density. Here's the plasma density on this axis. Here's the modulation frequency. The curves are what we expected. The dots are the data. And basically, we're exactly uh, where we expect it to be in terms of this modulation frequency. So this uh, looks like it works very well. We then, as part of our run one, also wanted to uh, test the acceleration of electrons. <clears throat> so we introduced an electron beam line. And uh, so here's uh, so this electron beam line that we use to inject electrons in our plasma. So we injected electrons in this modulated proton bunch and uh, saw the acceleration of these electrons. So here's the energy on this right-hand plot, the energy that was uh, gained by the electrons as a function of the plasma density on this axis. And uh, we basically expected to see about 2 GeV energy gain. And this is, in fact, exactly what we saw. So the electron acceleration in the proton-driven plasma wave field works. And, uh, and it can work with today's existing proton bunches. So this is, uh, this is a, a very nice success. So where are we today? So we had our so-called run one, 2016 and 2018. We then proposed a run two uh, for the CERN and it was uh, approved. So our run two started last year. And our goal in run two is to demonstrate that we can really have a stable acceleration of a bunch of electrons with these high gradients over long distances. And that we have uh, good properties of this electron bunch at the end of this acceleration process, which means a good emittance uh, so that the electrons are really you know, reasonably compact in the phase space so we can handle them uh, later on. So we see four phases to what we call run two. Uh, the seeding of the self-modulation process. Um, in this case, with uh, we're also trying it out with electron bunches, the seeding rather than with lasers for a technical reason, which I won't have time to get into. Um, we want to introduce a different kind of plasma cell. Uh, the reason is that we want to freeze the modulation process of the proton bunch before we destroy the whole proton bunch. Uh, so this is a, a key. And then we want to inject electrons and accelerate over long distances without emittance blow up. And for this, we're going to also have to introduce scalable plasma cell technology. So we're going to need plasmas that can reach uh, tens or hundreds of meters. And so we need uh, to have the right scale, uh, the right kind of plasma technology for that. So those are the goals for our run two. We started with this run 2A, this electron seeding of the modulations uh, last year. And uh, just to look at the your flash of the results, lining up uh, many events, we see, so the event numbers here, this is the timing of the micro bunches, and this looks very good. So our 
uh, electron seeding of the Wakefield process is fine. So run 2A. So this, this first point here, which is 2A, is uh, comes with a check mark. Uh, this was realized. Run 2B, which is starting next year. Uh, this uh, point, the main point of this run 2B is to have uh, this density step in the plasma. Uh, this will allow us to freeze the modulation process. This is the result which uh, we um, studied and understood was necessary to really maintain the gradients, these accelerating gradients at the GeV per meter level over long distances. Uh, so we've designed and now also prototyped uh, this new kind of plasma cell. It meets specifications. It's being built now and will be installed early next year. And we'll start our run to be uh, next year with this new plasma cell. Then down the road, we want to uh, really inject a compact bunch of electrons that can then maintain its emittance during the acceleration process. Uh, for this, we understood that we need a different kind of electron injector, which can produce electrons of higher energy, here about 100, 150 uh, MeV. And the reason is that this compact electron bunch can create its own little bubble in the plasma. And inside this uh, plasma bubble, it then uh, can preserve, the, the emittance will be preserved and we can accelerate over long distances without this electron bunch uh, blowing up. So this is uh, for run 2C, which will come after the next long shutdown of the LHC. So maybe 2027, 2028, uh, somewhere around there. And then run 2D, <clears throat> uh, we want to introduce a new plasma cell technology. Uh, which can allow us to have plasma cells which stretch out over uh, very long distances so we can accelerate to very high energies. Uh, so there are two different technologies which we're pursuing on the plasma cell. One is so-called helicon uh, plasma, which is something that's used in the plasma physics community. Um, it a, has a solenoidal magnetic field, uh, which is used to contain a plasma and it's the plasma is heated with the RF power. So this is under study, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics and Geisfeld has built, built a prototype and uh, this is coming along nicely. And uh, a second option, which would be much less expensive if we can get it to work, is just a discharge plasma. So here uh, there's a lab set up at CERN um, apologies for that. Uh, so there's a lab set up at CERN uh, and a group from uh, Lisbon and the Imperial College uh, in the UK are uh, developing this discharge plasma cell. And we're going to also try this out next year with a 10 meter plasma cell here. You see the light produced and it looks very uniform. So this also looks like an interesting technology for the future. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up just to tell you what we think we could achieve in terms of particle physics applications with our uh, with our scheme of proton-driven plasma wakefield acceleration. So since we rely on the, the protons, uh, we first have to accelerate the proton bunches to high energy, and then we inject these proton bunches into our plasma. Uh, this will mean it will be very difficult to achieve high luminosity. So the main, really the, the physics that we have to think about is what can we do with uh, basically high energy electron bunches. And so one can think of um, beam dump or fixed target experiments. So search for dark photons in a beam dump experiment or fixed target experiments in a new energy regime. Or we can imagine uh, looking at physics processes in a collider where the cross sections are very large. So I'm talking about QCD. Uh, so looking at QCD processes, for example, an electron, proton, electron, ion collider. Uh, and so here, although we would have low luminosity, we would be in a very different energy range. And uh, so we've done some studies here and we can see, for example, we could uh, extend the kinematic range 
from Hera by a factor of a hundred or several hundred. And so this could allow us to introduce uh, and enter the very new uh, regimes of QCD. So this uh, could be very interesting. And then of course, there are all the things that we haven't thought about yet, like uh, maybe applications for muon colliders and, uh, and these kinds of experiments. So I think we've just started to evaluate the particle physics potential. We've been focusing primarily on uh, developing this technology and showing that it works. I think we're well underway and uh, the ideas will come on how to use it. So as a summary, <clears throat> Uh, we've now had two runs in uh, Awake. Our goals for uh, run one uh, were completely reached. We're in the middle of our run two. In fact, run 2A, second half is just coming to an end this year. And then next year, uh, we start with our run 2B. And I think we have very nice long-term prospects. It's very exciting. And so stay tuned for the next few years. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very nice talk and uh, we are open for questions. So let me start by asking a question myself while the audience mm -hmm. can have um, thoughts. So how would you actually go about engineering a collision in such a, a system? Because I mean, it's, if, if you wanted to do um, a kind of uh, a beam collision experiment. Uh, the way the the technology is being constructed right now, you have uh, essentially in a wake field, you, produ you produce a, a certain beamed geometry, but how would you get the two beams to actually, you know, um, collide? Yes, so, uh, so we started thinking about that. So good question, thanks. So yes, so our, the acceleration takes place in the plasma and then the the bunch comes out of the plasma and has to be handled and transported in some way so uh there's actually one of our um postdocs has just put together a paper with a team on showing how uh, you could transport this bunch of uh, high energy electrons that was accelerated in the plasma to some downstream location so it's not happening in the plasma. Uh, the, the bunch, the accelerated bunch of particles is extracted from the plasma and then transported with some, uh, let's call it transport and focus line to the region where you want to do the collisions. Um, just to add to that, uh, do you see a deceleration when you uh, get out of the plasma or that's not a problem? No, it's not a problem. The, the issue, that we're actually looking at in some detail is whether uh, there's a, an emittance blow up when we come out of the plasma. So this, I think, would certainly happen at low energies uh, because it, there are always uh, changing field, let's say, uh, as you extract from the plasma, you, you can't go from these very strong fields to zero field in no distance. So there's a gradient, and uh, and when you traverse this gradient, then they can produce some transverse deflecting uh, forces, which then blow up your beam. But uh, our studies uh, indicate that when we're at very high energies, these will not have a significant impact. So <clears throat> I, I have to point out that we're not aiming for ultra low uh, emittances here, which might be wanted for, let's say, electron-positron collider. So as I mentioned, we know that uh, uh, that we have to aim for lower luminosity applications. So if it's a fixed target or a beam dump experiment, then the the emittances that we're aiming for maybe I, I don't know if these units mean very much to to people in your audience, but let's say ten millimeter milliradians, uh, and this is this can be achieved. Uh, despite these deflecting forces coming out of the plasma. If we want to have a collider where we collide our electron bunches with a proton bunch, then in any case, our luminosity will be uh, set by the size of the proton bunch. The proton bunches, the transverse sizes are 
much, much bigger than what's being discussed for E plus E minus colliders. So we think uh, that we won't have, it wouldn't be an issue to, to match the size of a proton bunch. So I think the main issue is, is really not any deceleration of the electron bunch, but a kind of a emittance blow up with transverse the deflections at the plasma exit. But I think at high so, energy uh, also will not be a problem. So I, I take over where you where you left. So this luminosity that we we all of us in collider um, experiment are really you know sort of one of the main figure of merit. Um, so um, uh, so what are the like you said the currently uh, it's not feasible to have an electron positron you know sort of uh, with a decent uh, luminosity but electron proton part probably that is okay. Um, but what are the sort of thoughts looking ahead that uh, how to um, further squeeze uh, the, the emittance or how, how to increase uh, the, the luminosity? I mean, whether you work on the uh, numerator of the expression, master equation or the denominator. So what are the thoughts uh, looking forward? Uh, because luminosity will, will be really our one of the key thing. Uh, so yes. So my, there are my thoughts and then there are maybe thoughts of other people. So uh, as you say, if we go to higher energies, then our cross sections go like one over center mass energy squared. And so then we say uh, our luminosity should uh, also scale with the center of mass energy squared as we go up in energy. Uh, that's a hopeless game, I think. That That's my uh, sense. So really trying to imagine I don't know, pick a number, 100 TV E plus E minus collider with luminosities of 10 to the 35, 10 to the 36. Um, you know, I don't want to look at the power bill there. Uh, that, that's just going to uh, to be really out of it. So I, I think my approach to this is to say, maybe we have, as particle physicists, uh, we need to think of what else we can measure. Um, and maybe be a little bit more creative. Uh, personally, I think there's still a lot to be done in QCD physics, uh, high density physics, collective effects. Um, we don't understand very much about QCD. The, what we understand is in the perturbative regime, a tiny little bit of uh, what QCD is telling us. There's a lot more there. So uh, I think it's gonna be very hard. Uh, to really solve this problem of very high energy, very high luminosity colliders. And maybe what we should be thinking about is other things that we're, we want to learn as particle physicists. And then these tools that we're talking about, like this uh, proton-driven plasma accelerator can produce very high energies, but not necessarily in the collider mode, E plus, E minus, but in these other configurations. So I don't have a solution. Uh, if that's what you were looking for, I don't have a solution on how we get to a very high energy, high luminosity collider. And my my message is also to all our theory friends: maybe we should look beyond just the, the collider and ever higher energies and smaller distances, and think of other kinds of physics we want to do. Right. One last question. Uh, yeah. uh, my question relates to the driver. You mentioned that the laser is about a thousand times less efficient than a proton driver. Uh, now, is there any hope on the laser or a, maybe a maser front that you might uh, be able to do it uh, that way with advances in? Physics? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, thanks. Uh, uh, normally, I do talk a little bit about uh, uh, the developments on the laser front. So, today's lasers uh, are, let's say, uh, standard titanium sapphire uh, lasers working with this chirp pulse uh, amplification. It works beautifully, uh, but it's going to be very hard to get uh, an efficient, uh, so high rate, high energy uh, pulse from that kind of laser. Um, again, if we just to connect back to our previous discussion, I mean, these lasers have a uh, sub percent level. Uh, efficiency to get energy out of the wall plug into your laser. So again, is, this would be horribly expensive to try to do things this way. However, uh, there are, I think, very exciting developments 
in using, for example, fiber lasers. Fiber lasers can be very high rate and very high efficiency uh, in terms of how much energy you get out of the, your wall plug into your laser pulse. Um, but they're, they're low energy per uh, fiber laser. So what people are working on is trying to put together arrays of these fiber lasers and phase them correctly. And the dream would be something like 10,000 uh, fiber lasers all synchronized so that you can add their uh, pulses together to produce one very high energy, also very high uh, rate laser pulse that you could use as your driver. I think if there's going to be a hope for something like an E plus E minus collider uh, based on plasma technologies, it would be in the end uh, using that kind of technology. So that would allow high rate uh, and efficient uh, and high energy uh, laser pulses. But that's still a, a development that's underway and we'll have to see how they how far they get with that. But it, it is promising, I agree, yes. Great, so thank you very much.